In this video, I'll discuss the various types of dividends and how dividends are paid. Then I'll discuss the factors that determine dividend payments. After that, I'll discuss stock repurchases, which have become at least as prominent as dividends as a method of distributing cash to shareholders in recent times. I'll discuss the factors driving the rise in repurchases and the factors that determine whether a firm will repurchase shares. And then I'll wrap up by discussing both spin-offs and splits. I'm pretty sure everyone watching this video knows what a dividend is. It's a payment from a firm to shareholders, usually in the form of cash. Let's talk about how that process occurs. Depending on the firm, usually the firm's board of directors will ask the CEO to begin issuing a dividend to shareholders, or sometimes the CEO will recommend the dividend. Regardless, the board will sign off on the dividend and decide the amount of the dividend. Dividends are currently taxed at the same rate as realized capital gains, meaning that you as an investor that receives a dividend should be indifferent to between the dividend and a comparable increase in the value of your stock. This hasn't always been the case, however. Changes to the dividend and capital gains tax rates have been shown to affect the decision of firms to issue dividends. Obviously, it's better to issue dividends when the dividend tax rate is lower than the capital gains tax rate. When the dividend tax rate is higher, it's better for investors that the firm reinvest net income into firm operations to increase the share price. Dividends are extremely consistent. The decision to initiate a dividend is a monumental decision because once the dividend is announced, investors expect the firm to continue to pay the dividend forever. When a firm announces it will begin paying a regular quarterly dividend, investors expect the firm to have enough cash flow to continue to pay the dividend forever. And this leads me to the most important thing you need to remember with respect to dividends. Dividends are signals. They are signals that the firm's board of directors believe the firm will be profitable for the foreseeable future. They are signals that the firm will have the cash flow to maintain the dividend until the end of time. Firms could potentially increase the dividend, but they will never want to decrease the dividend. Decreasing or outright cutting the dividend indicates to investors that the firm's board has doubts about its future profitability. When a firm cuts, suspends, or eliminates a dividend, the investor response can be dramatic. So I took this data from a very famous paper by Healy and Palapu in 1988. This is one of the early papers that examines the response by investors to dividend initiations when the firm initiates or starts paying a dividend and dividend omissions when the firm cuts a dividend or completely eliminates it. So this is a standard event study, meaning that what these authors are doing is looking at the abnormal returns around the event date, which is date, day T. Uh, so they're essentially adjusting the returns to account for the returns of the market. So basically think of the returns of the company or the, the firm stock minus the market returns on that day. That's more or less what they're doing. So any returns that you see here are returns where we control for the effects of the market as a whole. So the authors of this study, they show the abnormal returns over the 60 days prior to the dividend initiation or omission, all the way out to 20 days after the initiation or omission. And what you can see here is that there is a lot of price movement around the initiation or the omission. Uh, so the most important date is going to come on the date that the dividends are initiated or omitted. And as you can see, in the case of a, a firm announcing that it's going to start paying a dividend, there's about a 4% or 3.9% abnormal return on that date. If firms announce that they're cutting dividends, you're going to see on average, in, in this sample anyways, those firms saw a negative 9.5% one day return around the announcement of that dividend omission. So as you can see, 
investors despise dividend omissions. They will sell their shares immediately as soon as those dividends are cut or completely eliminated. And that's that's more or less what this study shows. This is why it's important to determine as a member of the board of directors that you can afford to continue to pay a dividend and not have to cut it in the future, say a year from now or even five years from now. Now, I need to discuss the factors that determine whether a firm will pay a dividend. First, we have current earnings per share. By now, you should be familiar with this formula. It's just the quantity of net profit after taxes minus preferred dividends divided by the number of common shares outstanding. There's a positive relationship between earnings per share and dividends per share. Firms that are more profitable are more likely to pay a dividend than are firms that are unprofitable. Another factor that it affects whether a firm will pay a dividend is the firm's growth prospects. Firms that have good growth prospects will likely need to invest money to take advantage of those growth prospects. For example, if Tesla was trying to increase its auto sales in sub-Saharan Africa, it would have to produce more cars. This means more factory capacity and more money to hire employees and purchase inputs. All of that takes money. If Tesla were to pay out a dividend, it would have less cash on hand to invest in its expansion into sub-Saharan Africa. This is why firms with good growth prospects are actually less likely to issue dividends. Next, firms that issue a dividend will need to at least maintain that dividend. In order to ensure that they're able to issue that dividend in the future, they need to ensure that they're profitable in the future and have cash on hand to fund that, those future dividends. This is why future expected profitability is positively related to dividend payouts. And finally, we have loan agreements. While some firms have no debt on their balance sheet, that's not always the case. Firms that borrow from investors or receive a bank loan like a revolving credit agreement might be subject to something called debt covenants in their loan agreement. Debt covenants indicate specific actions the firm can or can't take while it owes its creditors money. Now there's literally thousands of debt covenants that specify actions the firm can take or can't take. Several different covenants relate to the dividend decision. Uh, so firms that borrow money from a bank might have a covenant in their loan agreement that says they can't issue a dividend or they might not be able to increase the dividend while the firm owes money to that bank. The reason that this covenant exists is because the bondholders or the the firm's creditors as a whole don't want the firm to pay out money to shareholders while it still owes money to its the, bond, the bondholders themselves. Now let's talk about some dates associated with dividends. The first date we have is the declaration date. Remember, this is the date that the board announces a specific dividend and the amount of the dividend. If there's new information here, we'll see the greatest movement in the share price here. So th this would be day T in that Healy and Palapu study that I showed you a few minutes ago. As I mentioned earlier, dividend initiations historically lead to large increases in price, while dividend decreases or omissions cause investors to sell their shares. Next we have the ex-dividend date, or as it's sometimes referred to, the ex-date. This is the official date by which you need to be a shareholder and therefore eligible to receive the declared dividends. If you hold shares before this date, you become a shareholder of record and you will receive the dividend even if you sell your shares after this date. This is also the day that the firm's shares start to trade without the value of the dividend. Theoretically, this means that the share price should fall by the exact amount of the dividend on the X date, but academic research has shown that the decrease in the share price on the X date is actually smaller in magnitude than the value of the dividend. The next date we have is the date of record, and the date of record is the date the shareholder of record was identified or is identified. 
The date of record is usually the day after the ex-dividend date. Uh, it's typically the day after because it takes about a day for transactions to clear. The final date we have is the payment date. This is the date that historically the checks go out in the mail. Nowadays, however, the cash is transmitted electronically to your brokerage account. Let's examine how this works in the real world by looking at Ford's dividend history. So here are the past dividends that I pulled on Ford's stock. So as you can see, the declaration date for the for this dividend was 1-8-2020. The cash amount of the dividend, so this is a cash dividend, was 15 cents per share. The X date was January 29th, so if you wanted to receive this 15 cent dividend, you had to buy your shares prior to January 29th of 2020. Uh, you are the shareholder of record, and that data will get reported to the SEC by January 30th, and you get your dividend paid in March or March on March 2nd. So as you can see, Ford's dividend is extremely consistent through time. Uh, Ford will sometimes pay a special dividend in addition to a regular dividend, but for the most part, Ford's dividends have been very consistent. Uh, the last many quarters, Ford has paid a 15 cent dividend. So like I said, these things, they don't change a lot. Now let's take a look at the types of stocks we see in the real world. Regular cash dividends are the most common stock dividends in the world. These are regular quarterly payments to each shareholder with a specific cash value. They're fairly consistent as you saw from the example of Ford. Notice here that the dividend doesn't change and this would be a regular quarterly cash dividend. It's coming at uh, each quarter. Any increases in that regular cash dividend will typically be about three to five percent at a time. The increments at which the, the regular quarterly dividend grows are very small, a few pennies or maybe 10 cents or so for most stocks. Uh, as you saw in the Ford example, they don't grow regularly. They don't occur annually for most firms that pay a dividend. A firm's board can also announce that the firm is issuing a special one-time dividend. That announcement tells investors not to expect follow-up quarterly dividend payments. A firm issues a special dividend when it has a lot of cash on hand and no good growth prospects. The firm's goal here with a special cash dividend is to get that cash out of the hands of management and return it to shareholders. Stock dividends are dividends paid in additional shares of a firm's stock. For example, a 10% stock dividend would mean that you receive one new share of stock for every 10 shares you currently own. Because stock represents a percentage of the firm's residual value, a 10% increase in the number of shares means that the value of every share would decrease by about 10%. The benefit of stock dividends is that you don't immediately have to pay taxes on them. You're taxed when you sell your shares and have realized capital gains. Now, let's talk about the two ratios you need to know with respect to dividends. You almost certainly covered these in Finance 300, so this should just be a refresher, but we have two primary ratios that we talk about when we talk about dividends. The first is the dividend yield, and this is just the annual dividends per share divided by the current market price of the stock. So in the case of Ford that you saw earlier, it was paying out 15 cent quarterly dividends. So its total annual dividend would be 60 cents. And to get our dividend yield, we would just divide that 60 cents by the current market price of the stock. The dividend payout ratio is just the dividends per share divided by the earnings per share or DPS divided by EPS. Uh, so that will typically be somewhere between 0 and 100%. Now I need to talk about the alternative to dividends, repurchases. Stock repurchases are also well known as share buybacks. So you might hear them use, referred to in the popular press as share buybacks. Uh, a repurchase occurs when a firm buys back its own shares on the open market or from specific investors. Uh, when a firm repurchases its own shares, that reduces the number of shares outstanding and 
increases the future earnings per share of each future shareholder. As you might guess, there's fewer shares, so you're splitting the pie across fewer slices, so to speak. The firm can choose what to do with the shares it repurchases, but we should be asking, why do firms repurchase their shares? Well, there's many reasons why firms repurchase their shares. Uh, perhaps firm management and the board believe that the firm's stock is undervalued and a good buy. If they buy back their own shares, they have shares they can reissue at a later date. A consequence of repurchasing shares is that the firm's share price could be boosted by the increased demand in the shares. The next reason a firm might repurchase its shares is because it has a large amount of cash on hand right now in the short term. If a firm currently has a lot of cash on its balance sheet and it has no good future capital budgeting projects to invest in, the board might decide to return that cash to shareholders. Unlike a regular quarterly dividend, repurchases are one-time events. Investors don't expect a firm to regularly buy back its own shares. A third reason a firm might buy back its own shares is to defend against a hostile takeover. Perhaps an investor like Carl Icahn has acquired a toehold investment in the firm, meaning that he owns about 5% of the shares outstanding. Uh, if Mr. Eichen indicates he intends to acquire a majority stake of the firm's shares in the future via a tender offer, the firm's board might repurchase his shares at a premium in exchange for him not attempting a hostile takeover. So here's an example of what that might look like. Uh, so if uh, Carl Icahn uh, wants to try a hostile takeover of Oshkosh Corporation, what he might do is he'll issue a what's called a tender offer to the shareholders of Oshkosh, and he'll offer to buy the shares for perhaps a, a slight premium on their market price. And he'll buy any and all shares with the goal of getting the majority stake of the shares outstanding. Uh, so the goal here is to essentially control the board and then eventually buy up the, the rest of the shares of the firm. So repurchasing his shares at a premium is a good way for the board and the management of the firm to essentially drive him off. Uh, this entire tender offer technique being used by Icon and many other uh, investors is sometimes referred to as green mail. So what happens when a firm repurchases its shares? Well, a firm has two immediate options. It can cancel the shares after it purchases them, or it can choose to hold those shares as treasury stock. Treasury stock held by the firm does not receive dividends and can be canceled at any time. A firm might choose to hold repurchased shares as treasury stock for several reasons. For example, if the firm is a serial acquirer, meaning it acquires many companies, it might choose to use its treasury shares in a stock transaction to buy the target firm. In this scenario, our firm would exchange its treasury stock for the shares of the acquired firm at a specific ratio. Our firm could also reissue treasury stock to pay stock dividends, or if the firm has an employee stock option program, also known as an ESOP, it could also issue treasury shares when employees exercise their stock options. I'm willing to bet you're less familiar with stock repurchases than you are with dividends, and there's likely a reason for that. Until 1982, Repurchases were considered stock price manipulation by the SEC. That's because when a firm buys back its own shares, its future earnings per share will increase because you have fewer shares, and the higher demand for the shares in the immediate period could push the share price higher. However, in 1982, the SEC passed a rule that essentially legalized repurchases. Since then, use of repurchases has become more and more common. In fact, this is a chart showing the usage of repurchases or stock buybacks and dividends over the last 30 years or so. Uh, 
So as you can see, the green line represents dividends, and it's, you know, it's growing, but it's not nearly growing as fast as share repurchases. Notice here that share repurchases in the last several years, I mean, in many years, dwarf the amount of cash being returned to shareholders in the form of dividends. For example, in 2018, firms repurchased about $700 billion worth of shares versus paying out about $430 billion in dividends. Right now, the percentage of cash distributed in the form of repurchases versus dividends is about 61-62%. All right, now let's talk about another event in the life of a stock, spin-offs. Spin-offs occur when a firm's management and board decide it would, it would be beneficial to divest a subsidiary or division and create a new standalone firm. When the firm does this, all of the shareholders of the old firm then become shareholders of the old firm and the new spun-off firm. From the shareholder's perspective, they now own shares of two stocks of two firms, each with different operations and management. There have been many spin-offs in recent years, from Sears' spin-off of Land's End to Expedia's spin-off of one of my favorite firms, TripAdvisor. So, why do spin-offs occur? Perhaps the firm has a division that is problematic or has become less productive. If a firm has a division it's trying to sell and there's no buyers, it's often easier to spin the division off into a new enterprise with new management. This was the case when Foster's Group, the firm that produces Foster's Beer, spun off Treasury Wine Estates. A more probable reason for a spin-off is that the firm has become too diversified and management has decided they need to focus on core operations. If a firm has become too diversified, it can be hard for management to utilize their special knowledge of an industry or a geographic area. Yum Brands would be an example of a firm spinning off operations to focus on a specific geographic area. If you've ever been to China, you might have noticed that there are a lot of KFCs in the major cities. Yum Brands owns KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. The number of KFCs and other restaurants owned by Yum Brands has rapidly increased in the Chinese market in the last 20 years. In fact, China was one of Yum's top markets. However, the Chinese and American markets are extremely different. Uh, in 2016, Yum Brands decided to spin off its Chinese operations into Yum Brands China. This allowed the new management to focus on the Chinese market and the Yum Brands management to focus on the U.S. market. I've been a shareholder of Yum Brands since the spinoff, and I can tell you that both firms have performed extremely well. Well, for my benefit. Another reason to spin off assets is because a firm becomes too diversified across sectors. A good example of this is GE, or General Electric. For years, GE was seen as one of the most diversified firms in the U.S. It had operations in banking, aviation, manufacturing, venture capital, and other sectors. However, with operations in so many industries, how could management possibly coordinate resources? Over the past decade, GE's performance has really suffered, and the firm benefited from its financial services division known as GE Capital, but its profitability in other divisions was lagging. As a result, Jeffrey Immelt, GE's CEO, announced a restructuring of the firm in the mid-2010s. Over the past several years, GE has sold parts of its transportation, banking, healthcare, aircraft, and other divisions. GE also spun off part of its Canadian banking operations into Synchrony Financial in 2014. The goal of this restructuring is to return the firm to its core operations and allow its management to focus on their areas of expertise. All right, now let's talk about stock splits. So stock splits occur when a company increases the number of its shares outstanding by exchanging a 
specific number of new shares of stock for each outstanding share. So I know I've mentioned stock splits in a much earlier lecture, but in the case of, let's say, a two-for-one stock split, a firm is giving two new shares of stock to every shareholder in exchange for one of the old shares. So, for example, you might have heard of Tesla splitting its shares in a four-for-one stock split. In that case, if you own one share of stock prior to the split, now you own four shares of Tesla stock. Now, the big reason this is done is to decrease the share price to make it more attractive to retail investors or individual investors. So, for example, when Starbucks underwent a two-for-one split in 2015, the share price prior to the split was $95.23, and then the day the split actually occurred, the share price turned to, it became $47.65. Essentially, uh, it, it got cut in half. All right, now let's go ahead and recap what we covered. So the most important thing you need to remember with dividends is that they are signals of the firm's future cash flows. Investors view the initiation of a dividend as a positive signal and the omission of a dividend or the, even just a cut of the dividend as a very negative signal about the firm's future cash flows. And there are many ways that dividends are paid out either through regular cash dividends, special cash dividends, or even stock dividends. Next, I mentioned repurchases, and repurchases are used for a variety of reasons. Uh, go ahead and go back to that slide. But nowadays, more cash is being distributed to shareholders in the form of stock repurchases than through the use of dividends. Next, I talked about spin-offs, and spin-offs create two distinct firms where one existed previously. And spin-offs are usually a way for a firm to focus its operations and drop operations that might cause a firm to be too diversified. Finally, I talked about stock splits, and stock splits allow a firm to decrease its share price while also maintaining its market capitalization. And with that, I'm going to wrap up this video, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you.